Welcome to this event, which is part of my class. Uh, the title is Global Encounters at Our Doorsteps. Uh, we have programs that take students, so-called, uh, we call it global justice immersion trips to other places in the world. But we also have programs for people who can encounter global issues here in our neighborhood. And uh, we invited speakers for our class, and I decided that it would be open to the public. So I have permission <laughs> from our speaker that this is also <coughs> open to the public to share. And so before I am going to introduce her formally, I would like to express my appreciation for Gary King for mentioning the name of our speaker today when I was looking for resources. And so, um, let me introduce our speaker, Colleen Rowley, a retired FBI agent and former Minneapolis FBI legal counsel who in May of 2002 brought some of the pre-9-11 lapses into light. One thing that caught my attention, she was one of the three whistleblowers chosen as persons of the year by Time magazine. So I'm excited to have her speak in this uh, gathering on the theme or the topic, how do we defeat terrorism without terrorizing ourselves? Thank you. That uh, was a question quote that I actually uh, heard at, from a major, a very top counterterrorism expert, and a guy named Michael Sheehan. And when he gives the talk and says, well, the thing we were facing, the challenge, was how to defeat terrorism without terrorizing ourselves, um, he answers the question in quite a different way than I do. But his question is spot on. Uh, because the whole goal, if you know anything about terrorism, the whole point of terrorism is to get the other side so scared and stupid. I just. Uh, mentioned an example, you can't get any stupider than falling for a con artist who's telling you that he can uh, code read the television to tell you when a, a terrorist threat and turn around airliners. You can't get dumber than that. Uh, however, and then spend 20 uh, million dollars of taxpayers money for that on a con artist. You can't get dumb, dumber. And that was our head of our CIA and our Air Force that did this. So, so uh, that's exactly what the point of terrorism is. The point is to get you to do stupid, dumb things because if you, if you don't, really can't beat the, the other side through strength, you're gonna get them to be so stupid, so knee-jerk, reactionary, uh, that they will then actually do it to themselves. They're, they're gonna shoot themselves in the foot. And uh, this was actually, when I would start to say these things about um, blowback, CIA, the, the term in the CIA is called blowback. It's the law of unintended consequences. Um, and in theology, it would be called reap what you sow. It would be called karma. Uh, there's different terms, but there's a fundamental principle that doing wrongful things has these, this, this uh, come back to you. And actually, that was pretty, you know, pretty radical for a while. People didn't want to believe this, especially in American exceptional, exceptionalism, that these, uh, uh, that these terrible, pragmatic consequences would then come back on the United States for doing wrongful, unethical, illegal actions. Uh, now, actually, this is now becoming more, people are able to see it. Uh, we've, we've had for great examples, just plain PTSD. So people now understand that one of the consequences, pragmatic consequences of going to war 
is that the people who you send into the war uh, really uh, have their traumatic brain injuries as well as PTSD. They come back suicidal, homicidal, uh, and you start to see these things in your community. And I, I'm just going to diverge here because this is my personal story. But, um, you know, I, I, when I said this the first time back in 2002, the three main domestic terrorists, terrorists right around 9-11, both before and just a little bit after 9-11, the three main ones were Timothy McVeigh, who, who bombed the Oklahoma courthouse, John Mohammed, the sniper in D.C., who, sh who was killing people with a shotgun out of a hole in his trunk, uh, and there was a, a, another one who shot nurses in a hospital out west. They were all products of Gulf War I. Uh, the other main uh, domestic terrorists that people forget, they always say, well, we've never had another terrorist attack. Completely untrue. We had the anthrax killer. And the anthrax killer actually terrorized the United States at the time. This was more terrorizing than even the, the World Trade Center falling. To imagine that you could get mail and you open it up and there'd be anthrax spores. People were putting gloves on to open their mail. The Star Tribune put on gloves and, and, and had a special trailer to open up their, their mail. The anthrax killer, to this day there's some uh, uncertainty about exactly who it was, but almost no uncertainty that that anthrax killer was a military scientist from Fort Detrick. So, there's the connection between the blowback, and that's just one of the connections between our now rising domestic terrorism inside this country. And, and then my other personal story is I've known five people that were killed in different ways. Mostly I knew, knew their parents, uh, five young people who were killed in either Iraq or Afghanistan. I've known two suicides. My daughter's uh, friend, who's my daughter's in the Navy, her friend, uh, female, young blonde cheerleader from Michigan, got raped in the Navy. The Navy paid her $1,000, and she, she took the $1,000 a month for a year and then killed herself. And, uh, and, and I also know others. Uh, the, 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 the homicide, we, we, it, part of it is we're pretty complacent with suicide. In a way, we are, because we say it's them. You know, I, that's a suicide, it's just affecting them. Everybody knows Vietnam. The wall in Vietnam would be double if it was suicides. It's, it's more than that. It's homicides. The, in uh, Lake City, Minnesota, just south of here, uh, a police officer was killed by a returned veteran. So, I mean, this is, this, is blow, this is just one of the areas. When what our last 11, 12 years has been characterized is uh, by a type of thinking, and, in, and um, you know, if you, if you study ethics, it's called utilitarian ethics. And it's really confusing. Uh, I've had debates uh, on the ticking time bomb hypothetical, the torture example that people say, well, you know, I, I watch Jack Bauer's 24, and I know that if people's lives are in the hanging in the balance, that we have to uh, uh, use harsh tactics in order to kept, find that bomb and to save lives. So you, what you're doing is you're positing or concocting a great outcome that everybody is for, a happy outcome, that, and, and it's, a, it's kind of like a magic trick where they divert your attention to something they're really doing. Because your attention then is, is diverted, and this actually will tie in with human rights right now, too. They're, they're using, they're exploiting human rights the same way. Because your 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 focus is uh, on now this great outcome of saving lives, and then you miss up. You don't analyze the part about how you get there. Obviously, the ends justify the means, and the means then are waterboarding, torture, all these things. Uh, you, I use this example a lot because uh, torture under the law is like some of these principles that is so now ingrained and hardened. There are many principles, uh, laws that pass, that are not ingrained and hardened. There are many laws in the past that allowed slavery, laws, um, laws the, you know, in the Jewish tradition that they couldn't eat pork, still is, that, you know, and Muslim, that you can't eat pork. Actually, some of those laws at the time perhaps made sense, and so they were strong laws, but over time, uh, it's recognized that this law no longer applies to current society. So laws are always changing. But there are some principles uh, in ethics, the, kind of the Kantian 
principles that all, all theologies, uh, no matter what faith tradition you're in, uh, obviously, thou shalt not kill. Uh, certain, certain of these, the golden rule, I mean, you can find this stated in different ways in every religion and, and actually then also put into hard law. Well, the, the prohibition against torture is like that. It goes back to all of this data of the inquisitions and all of these crazy times when the witch hunt in Salem, on and on, all of these examples where, people, where they have realized that there is no way to get good information, intelligence, or the truth by using torture. Yes, you can get people to admit anything. You know, if, they, if you want to call people witches, Yes, after torture, they'll, you'll eventually break them down. You can break down people easy. And yes, they will, you will, you'll get them to, to say they're witches, and then you can kill them. Stalin did this for, um, and, and, and uh, Lenin, I think, but they did it because they were trying to, to, to propagandize. So you can get people to admit that they are traitors and whatever. Easy. But to get good information, uh, our courts recognize this hard and fast principle so long ago that it's forbidden. And there, it's not because the, the judges are somehow nicer and more ethical than others. That's not why torch, uh, a confession that was obtained as a result of coercion, uh, overcoming the person's will, that's not why it's illegal. The reason it's illegal is because it would be a fraud on the court. That's the reason it would be introducing. And yet our whole entire country now has... Not, a lot of it comes back to Bill Moyers. I just overheard part of the Bill Moyers talk. A lot of it comes back to the very highly deceptive uh, campaigns that are run. Our, our mainstream media is certainly a part of it, part of it uh, due to, to uh, conflicting interests. I got a poster here. They're conflicting interests. And they, um, they now have duped, essentially. They propagandize people so well that it's not no longer just politicians who are who are, are at fault or to blame. It now is actually most of the American people, because they press these buttons on people. Uh, and in wartime, it's it's very uh, it's the type of situation that is predisposed to doing this. And uh, the way that you gin up support for fighting in war is you tend to press, uh, if you look at Nazi Germany, but all, all different regimes that have tried to propagandize. There's about five emotional buttons on human beings. And if you press those buttons on people, you can really reduce them to jelly. Of course, that's what I started off with, was telling you why people can't think any longer. It's the, they are, and I think they're kind of in this order, fear, hate, greed, false pride, and blind loyalty. Now the false pride and blind loyalty are somewhat connected, but they're also somewhat different. So those five things, if you keep constantly pressing those on people, and they're very, uh, they're very, uh, what's the word, sneaky. I mean the false pride. Every single politician running for, for a position is gonna start off saying, you great Minnesotans, here we're the smarter. It's like 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 Wobegon. You know, we're we're the best, and here we have the best hospitals and the best school. Well, of course, everybody wants to believe that. But and that's that's where our American exceptionalism comes in now that we think that we are a little more brilliant, we're more civilized, and therefore we have the right, or at least the and then the ability to kind of lead in the world. And if our leading by example, of course that's hard now for us to lead by example and by other ways, so we're actually now leading by through use of the military, which is that we're going to give you a warning once, uh, we don't like what you're doing, and if you, if you, don't, uh, if you don't listen to the teacher, we're the, the super policemen of the world, we get to tell you what to do, we're the civilized ones. And other than, then we'll probably use our military might because we don't have, and this is the sad part, which all of the, a lot of the smarter intelligence people are worried about in the school is, is leadership is through uh, a lot of things, but largely it's through this kind of soft power, which is if you are a good leader and you're following the right example on human rights and stuff, then yes, you can maybe go out and tell 
uh, the Philippines. This is a great example on the Philippines. It just happened simultaneously. In Geneva, there was a conference on human rights. The UN held 22 countries criticized the extrajudicial killings going on in the Philippines. What's the problem? That same day, the New York Times front page said, President Obama compiles kill list. Extrajudicial killing. Can you imagine being the representative sent to the UN to try to lecture about the extrajudicial killings in the Philippines when your boss is, and that, and that article came from a need, maybe it's a perceived need, to brag to the American public because it's been up till not then secret, the kill list and how this was working. Um, and uh, so this perceived need to, to, to sh macho, I, I, I called it, uh, it was like Bush's bring them on moment. Mm -hmm. You know, he was uh, trying to use killing and the fact that I can make these, these, these decisions to, to point at people. Uh, we have PowerPoints and I, on the way here, I was listening to NPR, they say it actually is a deck of cards. They're using cards, uh, PowerPoint cards with these terrorists and today, they just did another one. They, they claimed that they were trying to target El Libby, somebody El Libby in Pakistan, I believe, or Yemen, I don't remember which country. And they said they don't know for sure yet if they got that Al Qaeda uh, target, but they know that they killed 16 people. So that's, that was the news and uh, Carrie Miller was, was talking to an expert who has a book out about uh, drone killing. And I, I did this week, when it came out, I did several interviews. I probably did a dozen interviews on radio about the drone killing. So um, how does this uh, impact uh, civil liberties? Well, uh, one of the answers to the question, uh, if I can find my exact quote here. Um, well, I'll, I'll give you a couple of different quotes. Um, with the terrorism, Martin Luther King Jr. said, you will never end terrorism by terrorizing others. Seems like a no-brainer, but that's, what, that's exactly when you launch the, the wars on terror. Endless, global-wide war on terror. Obviously the point is to try, and it was a kind of a crazy thing, it wasn't just to reduce terrorism, it was to end all threats of terrorism. Who could fall for that? Who could fall for that? I was in the so-called war on drugs. I worked in New York City in the FBI and we had uh, cocaine conspiracies and Sicilian drug trafficking and these types of things, heroin too, heroin and cocaine and different things. And uh, you know, we were told we were in the war on drugs, but nobody thought we were, nobody that I know thought we could end drug trafficking. We knew that we were collecting a paycheck every week and maybe we deluded ourselves that we could reduce drug trafficking to some extent, but that was it. You know, can you imagine if the war on poverty? I mean, to be honest, I don't care how liberal and idealistic you are, you can reduce poverty, but can you end it? Uh, all of these, this is, so it's a, it was a crazy notion, and, and we were allowed to preemptively guess as to who is plotting against us. You see the enormous blowback in this country right now with, with prosecutions of people who have not done, uh, carried out any action afterwards, and now you find them as, if you remember the first World Trade Center bombing and the, uh, all of, in fact, all of the crimes I'm aware of that in my career, they involved a crime. There was an actual crime that was committed. And of course, when you have a crime, I was talking yesterday to a high school class about serial killers. And you know, when you have a, a crime scene, and of course the body was killed, whether it was a blow to the back of the head or, or torture, these behavioral profilers could look at the scene and come up with quite a few really good educated guesses as to the, the characteristics of the serial killer. Well, you know why? They had something to go on. They had some evidence. Well, our, our new mode is that we're gonna, we're gonna end the terrorism, so we gotta be preemptive. So none of this involves any factual justification or evidence. The FBI uh, and others are sending out people infiltrating into uh, mostly mosques initially, 
but now into Occupy. Uh, they're infiltrating all kinds of groups. This is exactly on all fours with what went on during the Vietnam War. I think war periods are especially prone to this because, again, trying to maintain public sentiment in favor of the war is key. And so there's all devious ways of propagandizing, but, but when you get the groups, for instance, that are starting to dissent, as happened in Vietnam, and or maybe even dissenting on other issues. In Vietnam, it was feminists, it was um, Black Panthers for civil rights, it was Martin Luther King, um, all different, and, and now it's uh, the anti-fracking groups, the anti-fracking environmental groups have been infiltrated as if they could, be, they could become terrorists because obviously they feel strongly that their water should not be uh, tainted when they would turn on their faucet. So uh, this is now going on and it's, it's very simple. Uh, people pride themselves on being smarter than this, but largely it's very simple for a good uh, undercover agent slash con artist. <laughs> Uh, because they're living a lie, by the way, if they're undercover, and this was even true in drug trafficking. To get somebody to believe that you want drugs to buy, you have to be very, very good. You have to be able to fool people. So uh, undercovers and or t uh, informants, and many of the informants that the FBI is hiring are actually thugs. They actually have criminal records. One guy that they just recently used on one of these national uh, scope prosecutions was wanted in Pakistan for murder. And the FBI says, oh, well, so what? You're wanted for murder. We still will pay you. Uh, in the vicinity of the good ones that they're using for this, $150,000 to $200,000 a year of your tax money. Uh, so we have this, uh, uh, this really terrible thing going on in the, on the domestic side, which is a result of the foreign wars. Uh, a war of aggression is the supreme crime, and it carries the seeds of everything else. And so our subverting our rule of law here in the United States, our constitutional rights, uh, whatever, is a result of declaring this war on terrorism and treating terrorists as if they're not criminals. We're treating them as if it's a war. And uh, when, when people used to ask me about the Patriot Act, and it, again, it went into people's heads because there was a lot of, at the time, when the Patriot Act was first uh, put out, it was public. That was the good thing about the Patriot Act, unlike the executive orders uh, for CIA renditions and black sites and torture and, and uh, warrantless monitoring. The Patriot Act was public. And so people knew about it, 300 and some pages. Uh, people didn't read those 300 pages. And all they knew largely were there were activists saying that this was going to be problematic. If I had a graph and I could show you the problems in the Patriot Act, and there are a couple of, of problems in the Patriot Act, it would be about one inch high and the rest of what's gone on due to the we are at war mentality would be the ceiling. And a lot of that is actually secret. Uh, the drone bombing, the latest big secret out there, when I was giving this interview, I would tell the audience, uh, what you've got to do is get all of your friends and relatives who are lawyers, law professors, and judges to tell them that they, their livelihood, in fact, their entire legal jurisprudence, everything they work for, every, every how they make their money, is at risk. Because the, the drone bombing has said that an executive can be judge and jury. So all of our, it's, it's, it's due process, they said due process, instead of being an evaluation of the facts, first by a judge, the system, I used to, this is so hard to talk about now. When I used to talk, I only knew so much, but as time goes on, this just gets worse and worse. And I do want to stop with about 15, 20 minutes left. I used to use this as my example of how the criminal justice system works. And when you start off on a whodunit, let's say a murder case or whatever, it's like that old game clue, everybody's a suspect. Well, you don't have any facts, and so you really couldn't do too much. Uh, there, and there, I, I don't have time to go through this, but profiling, data mining, then you get to the point where there's tips, then you get to reasonable suspicion where you could actually detain somebody, but not for years until hostilities end. You could detain somebody after a bank robbery, for instance. If their description matched the bank robber and you caught the person running down the street, uh, the, and I taught this for 14 years, and if you messed up as an FBI agent, your evidence was thrown out of court. 
So this was all very important. But yes, you could detain somebody briefly, and then what you had to do is run to the bank, get the teller, run the teller back, and you maybe you, they said you could maybe detain the person for an hour or two based on reasonable suspicion. And then uh, the big one is probable cause. So all of your very intrusive actions under the criminal justice system, searches, execution of searches, monitoring somebody's emails or telephone calls, those were those required about a two, 100 minimum, 100 pages of facts. Before 9-11, uh, when I, for instance, I sat with earphones on listening to mob and mafia people in New York City. Uh, one, one of our wires on a mob went for nine months, and so I sat there every day listening in to these mob guys in their social club and in their cars or whatever. But every one of those monitorings were almost a year to two years to get enough evidence to get to this point of having probable cause with your 100, sometimes 200 page affidavit, go into a judge and the judge reads it and says, yeah, I agree, there's, a, there's reason to believe and signs it, then you got to do it. And then the final thing is you go to court, uh, you have your jury and you get convicted beyond a reasonable doubt and eventually you can appeal and even if there are mistakes made uh, and a lot of times this takes years and years and years and at the final end of the criminal justice system, I called it throw away the key. And when you get to, and it's many times it's many appeals by the way, so you get to throw away the key even at throw away the key, there are mistakes. And everybody knows about the DNA exoneration or whatever. So there are mistakes made. I used to tell about a case we had with a, a bank robber who looked like the bank robber. He was convicted and put into jail for four months and then we found the real bank robber. So uh, you even have mistakes with the criminal justice system. But can you imagine what you do when you just tip it upside down? And you say, no evidence necessary. All of these people we're gonna monitor. And that's what's going on right now. There are 854,000 uh, CIA operatives, analysts, FBI agents, uh, contractors, um, all these different cadres, 854,000, nearly a million, who have top secret clearances right now in top secret America. So you can look this up on the Washington Post, August of 2010, top secret America. Um, it's worse than that because there's about two and a half million who have uh, secret clearances in the United States. And so this is where we're putting all this money in, and we, but we've tipped it upside down. It can't possibly work. But yet we are told that we have to do these things in a utilitarian way, that the ends justify the means. And so in order to keep you safe, who cares about that old concept of probable cause? Who cares about that old crazy, you know, most, a lot of people didn't know what due process meant anyways. Due process, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom, um, uh, right to attorney, right against self-incrimination, which is the, the, the problem with the harsh interrogation tactics and torture and stuff. And now, indefinite detention of Americans with no level of pro a probable cause, no level of factual justification. So obviously our, our legal system right now is decimated. This is a lot more, I, I, people call these things, they talk about it as civil liberties. So you think, well I can do without a little liberties, that's just a, a nicety. No, the reason for this system is not, has nothing to do with somebody's wanting to be more righteous and more ethical or more legal. That's not why it exists. Over hundreds of years, the human beings in societies have found out that if you want to be accurate in first detecting illegal wrongful act, acts and then in actually you know, doing something about it, this is about the only thing we have. You know, I, I'm kind of a critic of the jury system. Our American jury system has lots and lots of, of problems. They pick people they have never heard about, you know, don't read the papers and all these things. But you know what? If you think about it, how can you think of anything better? The biggest defense of the American jury system is, well, it's not the best, but up till now, no one has really devised anything better. So the, the, the way our system has evolved makes utilitarian type thinking saying, oh well, that old system just gets thrown out. 
Now we're in the new war, we're in the whatever, we get to do these new things. And ever, since the Bush administration, that was the constant theme, is this constant uh, saying that in order to be secure, uh, we now have to do illegal acts. And they're no longer illegal, by the way, because our Congress, after they were secret for a while, the way it's happened is they've been legalized or attempted to be legalized. So warrantless monitoring, for instance, was uh, illegal, wholly illegal and secret. Same with the black sites, same with the torture. It was wholly illegal for a time. Then when there was a leak or it, it rose to public disclosure, then, uh, then our Congress went right to work and rubber stamped it and said it's great. And some of it is because people's attention span is not very long, and so, and they can't, part of it is, we also don't, can't deal with harsh reality. So people do not want to deal with this. This is very hard to deal with. I, even yesterday, some, uh, who told me? Uh, I don't like to listen to you. I, I was, I, on Sunday, I was giving a talk on civil liberties. And these are people who pay attention, read the papers, and even afterwards they said, oh, Colleen, this is just too much. I can't listen to this. Because nobody wants to know. This is a, a real denial. And by that time, then Congress goes to work and rubber stamps it. Partly, for instance, with the black sites and the, and the torture, a lot of the people in the Congress were advised ahead of time by Bush. Uh, that if there's one thing that in our, in, our, in our political sphere that has unanimity, almost unanimity, uh, with the exception of a handful of people of both parties that have fought against these laws and, and this undermining of the laws, it is these foreign policy and the domestic side of it. Uh, the last few votes, for instance, on the NDAA, uh, National Defense Authorization Act, which says American citizens can be um, detained indefinitely. Uh, the kill list that's going on right now where it's American citizens can be killed. Uh, uh, there, there's almost nobody speaking out against this. And this kind of brings me to theology, because what do you call somebody when there's in a kind of a Orwell, uh, a time of universal deceit when telling the truth becomes a revolutionary act? What do you call someone who is out there crying in the wilderness? Repent, repent, or you'll get a flood, or you'll get uh, whatever. You call him a prophet. Uh, there's another thing that I got called off the bat when I was when I was a whistleblower. A whistleblower is the other one. A whistleblower um, on the failures before 9/11, which, by the way, this is the key thing, have nothing to do with what went on after 9/11. The the real failures and incompetence and failures to even read the memos. I've got memos in here that say Osama bin Laden and uh, this other guy, Ibn Chechen, Ibn Qatab, and the, 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 it went to the top 10 or 12 in the FBI. They all claimed they didn't read it. Can you imagine if, if that had been said after 9-11, instead of this, we're gonna have to take the gloves off, we're gonna have to torture, we're gonna have to start the war right away on Afghanistan, whatever. If you can imagine if people told the truth the CIA and the Pentagon and the FBI that they had not read memos co complete that they had not the CIA had not told the FBI that the terrorists were coming into California they tracked them into California and didn't tell the FBI to this day there's still been a lack of truth on 9-11 so we could have fixed it I mean there are things to do one Easy thing, you would have mandated that any uh, document, especially critical piece of intelligence that was directed to somebody, had to be re read. How simple is that? I mean, that would have been the, that actually, that root thing about not even reading the intelligence that's directed to you, that is, is a, a huge part of this. But of course, the, the American public might have gotten a little mad, right, if they would have known the truth about 9-11. Uh, there might have been a blowback against Bush. So this was all stretched out, and over the years, little bits have trickled out, but by the time it trickles out, nobody cares. So uh, instead, all this gross overreaction was sold to people to keep them secure. And uh, I am going to stop here, but I, I just want to kind of now bring up some of these theology points. All right, has it, it, this is my, one of my great Bible verses, Jesus loves WikiLeaks. <laughs> And uh, the Catholic worker came up with this bumper sticker. But it, it harkens back to an actual Bible verse. 
And does anyone know in, uh, what the Bible verse is that uh, would be the basis for Jesus loves WikiLeaks? It's Mark 4:22. I made T-shirts, and I um, have uh, the, the 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 bumper sticker, and then I have the actual verse. And the actual verse of Mark 4:22 is, "For whatever is hidden is meant to be disclosed, and whatever is concealed is meant to be brought out into the open." That's pretty clear cut. And yet, I've mentioned this in a couple of fundamentalist type. Uh, uh, Arenas, and they've said that's not what it means, and they're trying to argue that this has a different meaning than uh, openness and transparency. And secrecy is a way. It's a lot of things. Um, where's my? Where's this one? Okay. This is. I give talks on ethics. Ethic, ethical line self policing is above the criminal line. Criminal line. Uh, unfortunately, this costs money to operate too much high up here, so people want to get right down to the criminal line where real policing comes in. Then, of course, this is what happens, is that you duck below the line if you think you cannot be caught. This is what's known as cheating. If it's just taking a test, it would be cheating, but it's also the enormous financial frauds we've seen. And actually, this is one of the blowbacks now of the war is we have sent this line of where people, uh, for a lot of reasons, our, our Pandora's box has been opened with this greed and stuff, so people are operating way below the line. Well, what makes this possible is secrecy. I mean, if you're in law enforcement, uh, we had the Petters case. He operated for 15 years a uh, Ponzi scheme. The only thing that allows the effectiveness of crime is secrecy. If, if uh, when you're talking to kids about an ethical uh, dilemma, and there are some hard questions about what to, what's right, you know, they call it two rights and stuff, what's the main thing you tell them to, to figure out between right and wrong? Well, if your grandmother was looking over your shoulder, if, uh, you know, like with uh, Hayden, the, the, the kill list, if, if the public knew this was going to be on the front page of the New York Times, uh, then, and get rid of the secrecy, would you still do it? Well, almost all the time. When you get rid of secrecy, the, 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 you're able to discern between right and wrong a lot easier. But with it, you get things like the Catholic, uh, pedophile priesthood scandal, uh, certainly J. Edgar Hoover's, COINTELPRO. You get the worst, and it can happen to otherwise good people. And I think that's the lesson here. Secrecy can actually turn otherwise good people into bad. And secrecy promotes this. So, Obama, uh, we all voted, a lot of people did, uh, uh, voted for Obama. One of the reasons, he promised, he said this explicitly, that he was going to be the most transparent president. He was going to, uh, right now, just in classification alone, it's up 90 percentile. I, I think they said, oh gosh, I wish I could remember that. 90 million documents or something like that was, were classified. So uh, all of the good government groups that know that if they could just get this information out, uh, that it would better the situation. Now, meanwhile, what we're, the United States has a secret indictment of, uh, of WikiLeaks and the penalty of, <clears throat> we don't know the charge yet, but if it's like the other charges, the CIA operative who revealed waterboarding is charged with being a espionage under World War I 1917 law about being a spy or a traitor. It's the 1917 espionage law. Ca charging our CIA operative who, who told the papers about waterboarding, uh, did charge an NSA operative who was this, one, of, one of the sources for warrantless monitoring. They're trying to subpoena more of the journalists. There's not only a war on whistleblowers, there's six it government insiders that have been charged with espionage. WikiLeaks probably will be the penalty. It can be execution and, and life in prison. Our own spies in the FBI. There were two FBI spies, Robert Hansen and uh, Earl Pitts, that were caught in the 90s. Uh, or I knew Robert Hansen slightly because I rode the elevator with him. And uh, he had spied for the Soviet Union for money, selling secrets that got people killed, the, the CIA sources, etc. And he got he had spied for 22 years, and when they caught him and convicted him for espionage, that was real espionage, not being a whistleblower, his wife still got to keep his pension. 
So look at the difference between before 9-11 and now. Now we're charging whistleblowers with this. Um, so secrecy is huge. And I just have one more quote. And then I'm, I'm going to cease. I've got so much more, but I think we, we have to stop for questions about now. We're, we go to 11.30? Is that right? 11.45? Oh, good. Oh, good. Oh, I, was, I was trying to hurry. All right, now I can say my quote slowly. Because <laughs> um, I get wound up. <clears throat> uh, Lord Acton uh, had the, the wonderful, immutable principle about power corrupts. And so if you understand this as the Founding Fathers did, they very much understood monarchies and tyrants be, uh, because they'd lived through it. And they realized we have to put checks and balances in ways of curtailing this power because power always corrupts. And it corrupts good people. So if you vote for your best friend in the world, um, you know, even a Mother Teresa, and you put that person in a position of power, good luck a year from now. Because that power will actually, it, it's immutable. Okay, we all want to believe not. We all want to believe in about benevolent dictators and etc. And we all want to believe that, uh, uh, you know, in goodness. And it, it's just not true. Power corrupts. Well, Lord Acton had another quote that almost nobody's ever heard of. Everything secret degenerates, even the administration of justice. Nothing is safe that does not show how it can bear discussion and publicity. So, systemic fix, easy, Obama was right. Very easy systemic fix, stop classifying this information. The memo about how we no longer need due process, I would say, in my radio interviews, I, I'm, I'm likening it to John Hughes' memo in August of 2002 that, that said torture was fine. And that memo, when the law professor saw it, and he had, he had cited wrong precedent, he had not cited precedent of prosecuting people for waterboarding, and he had grabbed the wrong definition of torture. I mean, it was like something that even a first-year law student wouldn't have read, wouldn't have been able to write. Except John Yu was under orders to write a memo that legalized torture. But when the law professors and, the, and whatever they saw it, they went, oh my goodness, this is incredibly bad, shoddy, and it had to be rescinded. I think, by the way, it's the only one that's rescinded. The rest of them are all equally shoddy, but at least this one got rescinded. So this new memo, of course John Yu's out, but they, must, they found new people to write these memos, says that due process, we used, to, we used to think it involved judges and juries and evaluation of evidence, but it can just be a PowerPoint in the White House. That's due process now. That actually says something like that. And that was what in the New York Times, but nobody's been allowed to actually see the mechanics of that memo. So one concrete suggestion, let's get a hold of that memo the same way as we got a hold of the John Yu one in 2002. Because I don't think, I don't care how great a writer, creative writer you are, I don't think you can wipe away hundreds of years of due process and say a PowerPoint and concocting a deck of cards by the executive can, can uh, do this. So that's a very good concrete example of uh, Okay, going back to my theology here. Uh, I covered secrecy and WikiLeaks. Um, you know, blowback in all theologies is a, is a, uh, the full quote is not you will reap what, you're, what, what you sow. It's um, God starts with God will not be deceived uh, and you will reap what you sow. But the part about God will not be deceived is, is the part about playing God. William Sloan Coffin said that the fundamental sin is arrogance because it invites you to play God. So when you're American exceptionalists and you get to concoct the outcome, you're so, you're so smart, you know that uh, torturing will, will find the ticking time bomb. You just concocted that. Well, there's no way that human beings are this smart. I don't care if you're Einstein. And by thinking you're playing God, this is the opening of the Pandora's box. This is a quest for the power to actually say we can kill who we deselect. We're smart. We know that this person, these 16 people killed today probably would have done us harm, so we're going to kill them ahead of time. Can you imagine a stronger example of saying you're playing God? Opening Pandora's box. 
Another example, uh, my husband got mad at me this morning, called me on the way here. I shouldn't even talk about this. But I posted a YouTube um, online before I came. And the YouTube is saying that the Stuxnet virus, that the U.S. and Israel devised a virus that would go into to Iranian computers and it goes into their seamer control or something like that and then it was to, to you know, make them not work. And so this was already two, three years ago. It just finally hit the papers. The U.S., we, we knew it uh, already that the U.S. was behind it, but now the U.S. has acknowledged, yes, and Israel, we devised this powerful virus that uh, for a time shut down or hurt the uh, nuclear power program in, in, uh, in Iran. Now this YouTube isn't for, you know, it's just kind of a hypothetical, but they said, what if that now has led, it, well they do know one thing, it got away. The virus, uh, once you know computer viruses spread, so it, they're saying it was targeted on the Iranian centrifuges, but it got away. And it did leak into other nuclear power because the seamer control is in a lot of places. So the, the question is, what if it is one of the reasons why the Fukushima uh, was not able to get control of the reactors? Well, I mean, even if it didn't affect Fukushima, can you imagine a virus like this that you've concocted? Reminds me of Alfred Nobel. Alfred Nobel thinking that dynamite would somehow help. And, uh, you know, and the part of this is, even if you're Einstein, you cannot figure out these ramifications. And that's why this utilitarian, uh, and, and be careful of the word utilitarian, because most people believe that means pragmatic. They, they think it's a synonym for what works. And so, you, so when you're arguing towards you, you say, well, I'm a utilitarian, and I believe that you know, if it saves lives, that's a greater number. If it saves 1,000 lives, and I have to kill one person, well, that's the, the greater good, and uh, therefore it's utilitarian. That is, that's what they call what works. Okay, utilitarian. That is called, that's a rule utilitarianism. Okay, so what works as a rule? If you had a medicine here and someone said this will, uh, this will uh, uh, effectively uh, treat breast cancer and you did a test and 51 women benefited and 49 didn't, you would say as a rule it's effective, it's, uh, it's rule utilitarianism. The, the one I'm talking about is not the same as that. It's called act utilitarianism. And it's making up an end that you have no evidence for, no justification. Torture doesn't work. Many, many books have been written on this, but you're, which are, it's a sleight of hand. You're making up an end. On the medical thing, it would be like you said, take this medicine for, uh, for cancer, and uh, uh, the test showed it worked 1% of the time and killed the other 99 patients. Now who in the heck uh, would, if you said, take this medicine, it might work, and I'm gonna tell you, it, it could save, save your life, well, which would be true 1% of the time. Well, no one in their right mind would do that. And that is actually what confuses people because they're believing that there's a, a, a choice between what works, what is pragmatic, and then these lofty, ethical, legal notions. And when you believe there is a choice, and, and Obama, by the way, when he was running for Congress, before the Lord Acton kicked in, he actually said it's a false choice between security and liberty. He says that's a false choice. Now he doesn't say that anymore. But, but it is a completely false choice because the, it's what is effective. These things don't work. Our, our system exists for another reason. One of the sources for how we should be acting now comes from theology. A lot of our law originally, thou, thou shalt not kill and murder, I mean, these things are no-brainers. The golden rule, the golden rule, fundamental, about treating others as you want to be treated, uh, is, is now over. Because those people in Yemen and Pakistan, even their children, don't matter very much to Americans. You know what else doesn't matter very much to Americans? Because it is other, it's not me, and I don't, the golden rule has really been kind of thrown away. One of the things that doesn't matter are military. Uh, I, I tell people I know five, five uh, young people that have been killed. I t tell about this story about PTSD. Majority of Americans, I don't care what party, 
the majority of Americans don't care. And I would say the, the liberals or the, the progressives are worse because they think they have a very proud pride that they would never in, even think about the military. So they care less about. But this othering, this othering, which is a form of racism, is actually now fueling all of the, the terrible things we're doing. The answer is to have the golden rule and always think about how this how it would be if it happened to you. Can you imagine drone bombing in the United States? Uh, we actually have lots of terrorists. We have bona fide terrorists living in the United States. One was a Cuban. There's a Cuban guy who years ago bombed a passenger airliner uh, because he was against Castro. Cuban national. A Cuban national. Right, I mean, not the people of Cuba, but the people that... You know, right, an American Cuban, yeah. I guess, now, because he yeah. lives here. Uh, but this, these were anti-Castro people, and he, he bombed an airliner. Can you imagine now, uh, under the law, if, if this OLC memo would hold, can't, uh, Cuba could come to Miami and bomb Miami. Can you imagine what Americans would say about that? Say, well, why didn't you just come and get him? Why didn't you go through the legal process and extradite him? No, you just took it into your own hands and bombed Miami and it killed uh, 30, 40 people. And maybe you got him and maybe you didn't. Maybe you had to bomb 10 times to get him. Can you imagine what this is doing? Uh, so the golden rule, um, it's not hard to be a prophet right now or a Cassandra. Uh, Cassandra was doomed to constantly warn and then watch the worst happen, because no one listened. Um, I actually warned about the Iraq war. I, I gave up a whole GS level at work because I was considered a, a, a traitor and, and uh, not trustable and all this, because I warned that Iraq would prove counterproductive. And that was considered so terrible to say in, in, uh, in February and March of 2003. Okay, completely right. Now, all these years later, I'm completely right. And I have not had a soul, not one person ever said, you were right about that. Never. It's, it's incredible. This, this is this Cassandra thing is just terrible. But it's not hard to be Cassandra or a prophet right now. All you have to do um, on the NPR today, they were saying how difficult, how thorny. This is what they said on NPR. He was talking... Uh, the new book out by this expert is called uh, Kill or Capture. Kill or Capture. Obama, I mean, excuse me, Bush, of course, was criticized for capturing, putting people on Guantanamo, sending them to black sites. Some of them died in the midst of being tortured and beat up and stuff, but largely his was still capture. And then he got criticized for it. Obama is kill. And so he's avoiding all of those thorny problems of being in the courts by kill. That's the name of the book. So this commentator, though, who wrote the book, the author, uh, Carrie Miller, was saying, but how do you deal with all of the hard, difficult, ethical, and legal questions? And it was Carrie Miller. I was on a, I want to slap her. <laughs> uh, no, these are not real hard, difficult, ethical, and legal questions. Thou shalt not kill. I mean, that is the, the basis. Um, there's another article, I think it'll be up on Huffington Post by an international uh, relations professor called Just War, you know, the, the Just War Theory, or Just War. And I think that's a great title. Uh, war actually is illegal, and wars of aggression. Uh, the whole point of, of this uh, kellogg Bryan treaty back after World War I was to make war illegal. They used that kellogg Bryan Treaty that was signed by the world at the time to make war illegal to prosecute after uh, uh, World War II. That's the Nuremberg Principle, War of Aggression. There's no more War of Aggression. There's no more Nuremberg Principle. We're launching preemptive wars. And it's largely done through the complacency here in the United States. It's not just our politicians. This is now the people themselves. And it's a, for a lot of reasons. Uh, there, we, we don't have time to go into all those, but there's a lot of reasons why this complacency. Um, I think I've covered. I'm going to stop and take some questions. Uh, and.